But I suppose because we were a business to business company, you prioritize the customers because strategy and structure is driven by your customers. So you have to understand your customers. You have to try and get ahead of how they're thinking. And the second priority, and it's very close priority, was the employees. Because one of the things that I began to understand quite early on was that in many ways we told them less than we were telling our shareholders. And they were having to learn too much about the business from outside sources. So it became really important to spend a lot more time communicating directly with everybody from the management through to the shop floor, and also to try and avoid the disintermediation that the unions provided. So historically, we'd spent too much time talking to the union leadership and not enough time talking to the employees. So I spent a huge amount of time uh, talking to employees in lots of different environments. And then thirdly, of course, you have to talk to the shareholders. I prioritized, as it were, editors, uh, trying to tell them about the context and the company and create an understanding of what we were trying to do. It's very hard to talk to the broad spectrum of journalists because increasingly there are no specialists. So you're dealing with generalists who are either interested in you or completely uninterested in you. So I focused on the editors so that you, hopefully they'd be able to judge what was being written about them in the context of what, you know, the conversations we'd had over, you know, lunches or whatever. I thought about that, as, as it were, in the negative. I couldn't see any particular merit in, in, in building up a picture of my private life. This isn't supposed to be sort of Benedict Cumberbatch's Hamlet. You know, Rolls-Royce is a very strong brand. It's going to be around long after me. So I wasn't trying to impose myself on the company. So I had a pretty simple rule. I didn't do um, interviews about me. I didn't do these profile pieces. Um, but I would talk about the company or important issues such as the future of manufacturing or the role of government in industrial strategy, which I thought were really important both for the country and for Rolls-Royce. I don't think you can have different messages for different geographies or, or countries because, you know, information pass, travels very fast now and remains around forever. So I don't think you can say one thing in the UK and then say something different in Germany and something else in the US and something else in China. And actually, I think one of the things about being a chief executive is that you have to have a consistent message and you need to be very willing to keep on repeating it um, because consistency matters and you need to get it into a language that is repeatable and that is, is memorable. So you need to simpl simplify as far as you can the messages you're trying to get across and not to have too many of them. I think it's got um, tougher being a CEO for a number of reasons. If I think back to my early days, I made a lot of mistakes and I probably had a more tolerant press and investor base than exists today. And I think that tolerance is, is part of the issue. And I think the other thing is the increasing view among the shareholder base that they are the constituency that matters. And my view was always slightly different. Um, I thought that customers mattered a lot. I thought employees mattered a lot. Clearly shareholders mattered a lot, but not more than anybody else. And the truth is that there are relatively few long-term shareholders. And I was in a very long-term business. And therefore the influence of people who are taking a relatively short-term view has perhaps become too great. 
I think that is the case, and I, th and I think that explains to some extent you know, the increasing focus on the private sector. And I think one of the things that's worth remembering is most companies are either private or state-owned. The listed sector is the minority sport, but of course it gets all the attention. You know, it's what the press focuses on. And there are very different views held by private companies. And they, for instance, most family-owned companies would want to be conglomerates for all sorts of reasons. They want to balance their business, they want to balance their portfolio. So they would be at odds with the common view among public company shareholders who believe that they will create the portfolio that they want and they want pure plays as part of that portfolio. And it's quite interesting seeing what's happened in the technology sector where quite often these companies have floated with share structures which allow them to behave more like private companies than listed companies. So I think you know, given the fact that the private sector is bigger than the listed sector, it's possible that over time either companies will migrate to the private sector or that some of the practices that exist in the private sector might become more prevalent in the public sector because people see them as being preferential to the way that shareholders behave and companies as a consequence behave in the listed sector. And I think a, a lot of CEOs have at one time or another said to themselves, look, you know, I'm going to try and run this company like a private company. Of course, it's in the listed sector. We have to respect our shareholders and inform them properly. But one of the things we should inform them is that we're trying to run it like a family company. We're trying to run it for the future. And frankly, I had no choice in Rolls-Royce. I mean, the average life of a program, it, just a program, an engine program, is twice as long as the average life of a company. I think in the consumer sector, you can get into an environment where the CEO is the brand. Um, in the business to business, it's less common and I think shouldn't be sought by the CEO because they are going to go and the company is going to persist. Um, I found the pressure um, for, as it were, comment quite resistible. Um, and I thought it was important to resist it. I mean, we had a, a situation in roles before I left where we had an engine incident and there was a huge clamor for information. And we took the view that we should only give information when we had good information. And we could say something which we weren't then going to contradict. And that took time. And there was a certain amount of um, resistance to that approach. But I think it was the right one because it meant that we could come out with facts and certainty about the outcome rather than just responding ad hoc um, on an uninformed basis. And I had a similar experience post 9-11 where, again, there was a huge clamor for us to say, look, what's this going to do to you? you know, what are you going to do about it? And my priority was to understand how it's going to impact our customers, understand how it would then impact us, communicate with our own workforce and get them on side so when we actually did it that it would be done with their cooperation and that they wouldn't be learning about what we were doing from the press and that took time it took longer than people wanted it to and expected it to but I think it was the right thing to do at the time and so you know the danger with modern communication is that you do feel the need to respond because you can I mean the truth is that the vast conglomerates that were created a hundred years ago, who were international, you know, communicated by letter. It gave everybody time to think, A, and B, it allowed people 
to exercise proper delegated authority rather than what I used to call elegating stuff um, because they could. Um, so I think there are lots of positives associated with modern communication, but there are also some negatives. I think it depends on the industry. Um, and I think it tends to be very sector-based. Very few transcend um, in the way that Jack Welsh did. Most are you know, sectorally specific and strong. And they have a different sort of profile um, in the US, but I don't think they particularly communicate differently. And the ones that I know well tend to take a actually a not dissimilar view to mine, which is, you know, to think of themselves as being caretakers and and you know not there to as it were dominate the brand that they're involved in. No, I don't think so. I think it's more to do with context. So, you know, most people realize that they're there, you know, for a a period of time. I think it's clearly different if you're a founder and you're, you know, key to the development of a business. But most of us, you know, are lucky enough to, you know, be part of a, you know, an established institution. And, you know, and you try and do your best for it over the period of the time that you're there.